Calm down. So, yeah, that, that was it. That was an oldie but a goodie, wasn't it? And I mean this. I mean this song as well. So, you know. So, welcome to Oak Bridge. I think they drank a lot of coffee this morning, Gary. You kind of got them going on that. So, uh, appreciate you guys all being here this morning. You know, unapologetically here at Oak Bridge, we believe that it's all about Jesus. It is all. He is all of our hope. Everything is about Him, and that's why we're gathered here this morning. I want to start us off with a prayer, if we would. Your Father in heaven, we are just uh, amazingly grateful for the message of that song, for the fact that, that, that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven. Father, we are just in awe of your love, in awe of your goodness, and, and we gather here, Father, and a whole lot takes place on Sunday mornings. We get to meet with other people. We get to be encouraged. We might get to challenge one another. We get ministered to. We hear uh, a message on your word. We sing songs of praise. Um, and that is all amazing, Father. It is, but, but at the core of it all is to bring you glory and honor that you alone deserve. So we are just gathered here in the name of Jesus. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. So I'm Herc Noblet, one of the pastors here. and My name's Kelsey. I um, have a few announcements for you. Um, 
just welcome to church. Welcome to Oak Ridge. We are so glad you're here. If this is your first time, we have a few announcements. Um, there are new guest brochures for our first time guests, and these are available just at that information center. Um, you can learn a little bit about our church in here, and then also grab two free coupons that are in here. One's for a free drink for, from our cafe, and the second is for a free t-shirt um, for everyone who's with you. So if you have the kids, the family, whoever, take that back to our bookstore just down that hallway and you can all get a free t-shirt. Also, if you're visiting, you'll notice we don't take an offering in service. That's by design. We ask that you not give and let this service be our gift to you. But if you call Oak Ridge your home, there are joy boxes throughout the campus and there's also giving online. And then lastly, there's no communion in service, but there's a room right behind me called the Reflection Room. It's open all morning and there is communion available in there. Awesome. You know, you guys the last couple of weeks have responded in amazing ways with the food drive and with the diapers and things. And Tom told you last week how Arnold Food Pantry was just, you know, overwhelmed and just, uh, you know, they were they were totally grateful for what you guys did. This is from the Hand in Hand Crisis Pregnancy Center. And I was able to bring uh, the diapers, formulas, wipes, all those things down to them. Um, and, and you know, it was kind of cool. She's like, I don't even know how you guys knew about this. They just put out the need on Facebook. And I don't know if it was Tom or somebody that, that just kind of saw that and, and put it out there. So they were in awe. But this is what they, they wrote. They said, Dear Friends, on behalf of Hand in Hand Pregnancy Help Center, I would like to thank your congregation for blessing this ministry with a huge donation of diapers and wipes, much needed items at this time. Gifts such as these have incredible power in the kingdom of God. And again, just, just stopping and being generous has huge power in the kingdom of God. That's so, so, so true. It says, for one, we are reminded that good gifts ultimately come from God. God gives gifts, as is said so well in James. Every good, and th good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. And second, God uses people. He could accomplish his purposes in so many ways. And though we don't think about it, he could provide for this ministry in another way, even as he rained down manna for the Israelites every morning as they wandered in the wilderness. Instead, he chooses to work through people, people like you. He could do things all by himself, but decided it is much better to create a team that works together to bring this ministry to fruition. Thank you for being a part of Hand in Hand's team. We appreciate you and know that with every victory won, God is using all of us together to play vital roles. So thank you guys for, for doing that. Did you mention what, what, what do we have going on tonight? No, tonight is the edge. Woo! <laughs> Um, and the Edge is just our student service. We're actually in the middle of a super cool series. It's designed all by our seniors. So they came up with the content, the songs. They talked to Josh and Tony about what they want to hear about. Um, so we're in the middle of that. It's tonight at 6. We're going to hear another great message and then have small groups afterwards. If you've never been, I would encourage you to come check it out, um, get you plugged into a small group. And um, they're really fun nights. So Make sure you come check it out. Yeah, we got a couple big things. You know, uh, October is our anniversary month, so we are going to be 15 years old coming up here in a few weeks. And, um, in, you know, in celebration of that on, on October the 21st, so in two Sundays from now, we're going to encourage everybody to invite, to invite, to invite, to bring friends, to bring neighbors, to bring family members. And just we want to just pack this place out. And just, just again, because we're excited what Jesus has done in our lives, and we want everybody to get that and to, to see that, and that's why we exist. So on the 21st, challenge is out there. Let's pack this place. You guys invite, invite, and bring. Maybe somebody that you've just kind of been on the fence with, just take that step and invite them on the 21st then on the 28th is actually our six it's you got 16 years down here it's 15 yes we were established in 2003 this is 2018 I think that would be 15 years so nope 2003 so pastors not quite with it all the time over there so um 15 year anniversary is coming up not 16 year anniversary on the 28th we always kind of get crazy and wild in here so again a, a great time of celebration and, and expect you to come and, and hope you to come on that day and then um, we um, we had a big day yesterday we had a golf tournament so we had a great he has great turnout you know it's funny two years in a row now the weather has been kind of you know where we're worried about it and we have prayed and it has started pouring like within an hour after we finished each time so so if you've got a wedding or something coming up we've decided to start a ministry where you just give us a lot of money and we pray hard and the weather will start you know come off so 
Um, we're going to do that. But uh, golf tournament was huge. Here's amazing. What, what they're trying to do with that is, you know, I think we have great children's ministries, great next generation ministries. We pour a whole lot of money and time and energy into our teenagers and, and college age. And so this golf tournament goes to, to help uh, keep that at an excellent level. Again, it's all about Jesus, but to bring that up, you know, they raised last year, they raised in the first year of the golf tournament $15,000. This year, over 25000 So, yeah. And I was encouraged by my own play. I only, I only dropped five balls in the water into the woods. So that was a good round for me. So, um, and then, uh, so I think you've got, you know. Yeah, was, yeah. yeah. I was volunteering at the golf tournament. It was a blast. But it got me to thinking, how many golfers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Four! <laughs> that is stupid. All right, so. Uh, hey, why don't you guys stand up and say hello to somebody around you, and let's go to God and worship.
You guys can go ahead and take a seat. You know, I'm going to give you a gift here in just a moment. In the, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, um, there's a place where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And, you know, I, I was with a group of obturns this morning, and, and we were praying, and I said, you know, there are a lot of people that are going to be here this morning that just are hanging on by a thread, and they are coming here to just, just to hope to get hope and, and, and to hope to find, you know, some promise, something that they can just hang on to, how to take their next step, and you might be one of those. And, and, and maybe you're a person here that, that all this week you, you haven't, cried out to God one time, and maybe right now you're even feeling a little guilty about that. And here's what I want to let you know about our Father. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not going to punish you because he hasn't heard from you for this past week. As a matter of fact, I think he's saying, come on, come on, I'm seated on my throne. I'm high and lifted up, but I'm not too busy to hear from my children. So let's go to God. I'm going to give you two minutes, two minutes just to pray, just to be calm, to be still and talk to our Heavenly Father. So go ahead and do that. Father in heaven, thank you that you're the giver of all good things and that, that you heard those prayers. And um, Father, thank you that, 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 that you react and that you speak to us still today. Father, help us to relinquish control of our own lives to your spirit, to your control. Help us to do what we know to do, what, what, what you guide and direct us to do, and help us to trust you for what only you can do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thanks, Herc, and thanks, Ben. And wasn't that opening song just amazing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. All of it was good. Um, we start a series now today called Radical. So if you're new to our church right now, by the way, my name's Tom Noblet, and I'm one of the pastors here. And um, this is, the goal is to make this more radical. So uh, to live more radically. And you might say right now, well, I don't even know what that means, what it means to be more radically. Well, that's for the next four weeks is for you. But just take a look at somebody around you and just say, I want you to live a more radical life and I want to too as well. Say that to somebody just around you. I want to live a more radical life. And uh, I'm going to give you a little memory thing that's just so corny. I don't even know if I should do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. It's just... Uh, during this series, we may step on a few toes, all right, mine included, so I want you to be aware of that, but uh, you guys fill in the blank, ready? Old McDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. Okay, now we're going to change it. Instead of the O at the end, say E, okay, ready? Old McDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-E. 
All right, now in 35 minutes, that's going to mean more than a rhyme to you guys in just a second. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my grandson, Henry. I've got grandchildren. You guys have heard about it. They've been long enough. My world kind of revolves around them. God's using them to speak to me a lot uh, by watching how they respond and what they do. And uh, yesterday was a great day at the golf tournament. We had a phenomenal day at the golf tournament. I was there. I didn't golf. I was able to kind of walk around and take pictures and drive around. And I actually had my two, two of my grandkids with me, Henry and Tripp, and my wife, Kathy. And, and uh, as we rove, drove around, I'll show you some pictures, just three quick pictures up here real quick. So Henry's in the red hat. That's Tripp in the uh, G hat. Both of them uh, apparently don't have upper parts of their head to hold the hat on. I, I don't know what the deal is there. Next one. That's with Josh and his team, and there's Tripp and Henry as well. Next one. And so Henry's in the red hat. So I want to just tell you just a little bit about uh, Henry. Henry's the middle child. There's Tripp, who's five. There's Henry, who's three. Then there's, there's a newborn baby named Lola. And uh, this year, uh, Henry has tried to learn to deal with Tripp starting kindergarten. So he's gone all day long, and that's bugged him a little bit. And now Lola is... Uh, uh, onto the scene, and there's a new sheriff in town now, uh, per to say. Show you a picture of Lola. This next one. Keep going. Got, got baby Lola there, tech team. You listening to me? <laughs> I'll hear oohs and ahs when you show it up there. You got, got Lola? Not yet? All right. Well, anyway, there you go. On side screens. Look at the side. All right. Do one more on the side. I think there's one more picture. Is, there, is that the only one we have? I don't know, Kathy's got a hundred of them. But anyway, uh, Lola's the new sheriff in town. So I don't know about, you know, all the studies done on, on, on middle kids, but, but Henry now doesn't have Tripp, the older brother who he idolized. And now he's not, you know, Katie's holding, my daughter's holding the baby Lola all the time. So uh, Henry's become bitter. He's, be, he's actually become bitter. And uh, this, him being bitter doesn't make him better. You guys all agree with that statement? I'm just going to make it just easy. Him being bitter doesn't make him better. And I'll give you some examples of of how he's bitter. When we were there yesterday, we got done driving around on the thing. And I said, okay, Tripp, you guys can play with my iPad and play some games on it. And so Tripp plays for like a little while. Then Henry plays for a little while. Then Tripp plays for a little while. And then Henry plays for a little while. I said, now it's Tripp's turn. And Henry goes, no, I don't want it to be his turn. I said, well, it is his turn right now. I said, so Tripp's going to play. So Henry got mad and sits underneath the table. Now, he's totally what? Bitter. I mean, he's just, he's totally bitter. And uh, <laughs> unbelievably, I, so I'm writing this message this morning around 4 a.m. And uh, I couldn't find a picture of Lola on my camera. I knew Kathy had him. I didn't know how to get it off my camera. So I, I'm waiting for Katie to show up this morning. And Katie runs our children's ministry. So she's normally here, you know, by 8 o'clock. I could not find her. And so I ended up calling her phone. I said, Katie, where are you at? I need a picture of Lola where I can show him how cute uh, my granddaughter is. Not that she's the cutest granddaughter in the world. Well, she could be the cutest granddaughter in the world. But I said, they need a picture. I said, where are you at? She says, oh, I'm just out on the parking lot. Your grandson, Henry, is naked, won't put on clothes, and he won't come in the building. He's throwing a fit. <laughs> Hold on. It's worse. She had been in the parking lot for 40 minutes. So he's a, a bitter little boy right now, all right? Now, it's not making his life better, but he is bitter, all right? Now, this is not new stuff, what I'm letting you know is. It seems like today, more than ever, we're talking about bitterness, rage, anger, fighting, and slander. That seems to define the times we live in. There is bitterness everywhere. This is not new stuff. I'm going to tell you just a couple stories. Uh, I'm going to, you might find yourself in these stories somewhere. And uh, it's going to be talking about bitterness. There was this guy named uh, Saul, and he was the first king of Israel. And not to give a whole lot of detail on it, but you can read all this in 1 Samuel. But here's a little bit for you to know about Saul. Uh, the Israelites wanted a king. They'd never had a king before. God said, I'll be your king. I'll be the one that, that, that guides you and drives you. And the Israelites saw the other surrounding nations, and they had kings. So they said, we want a king. So God said, well, it won't go well if you have a king. He's going to take everything from you, and he's going to want taxes, and he's going to take your sons and daughters, and they become slaves. And anyway, he gives in to them, and they have a king. And God says, well, I'm going to anoint this guy named Saul as king. So he's the first king of the nation of Israel. 
And uh, this is about 3,000 years ago, about 1,000 years before the time of Christ or 3,000 years from today. So I'm going to read a couple verses and just tell you a little bit about Saul. Saul started off and he was humble. In fact, when you read 1 Samuel, you'll read where he, when he found out he was going to be king, he just couldn't imagine that he was chosen to do this. So I'm going to read 1 Samuel 9, 1 through 2, and just watch a little bit about Saul. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abel, the son of Zeror, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphiah of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul. Now this is in 1 Samuel 9, 1 through 2. As handsome and as young a man as could be found anywhere in Israel. So Saul was handsome, right? And it says, and he was a head taller than anyone else. So not only was he a good looking young man, but he was big, he was tall. And at that time, a lot of times the kings defended the nations. So I don't know if that's why God picked him, but the nation Israel uh, saw that. All right. So this was the time of the prophets as well. And what this meant was God spoke through prophets uh, 3,000 years ago. He'd anoint a person, the people knew it, and whatever this person said, they knew that God was speaking through that. So this was the time of the prophets. The prophet this time was a guy named Samuel. So 1 Samuel 9, 15 through 17, uh, read a little bit more. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. So God's speaking to Samuel. Anoint him over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines, who are their enemies. He says, I've looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, this is the man I spoke to you about, and he will govern my people. So now you see this picture of, of, of a Saul, a good-looking young man, tall. He's been anointed by Samuel, the prophet of the time period, to be the first king of Israel. And then we read on a little bit about what happened to Samuel's life as we move ahead. 1 Samuel 14, 47. After Saul had assumed his role over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. Moab, the Ammonites, Eden, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. And here's a key part. Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment on them. Another verse says, whatever he did, he won. So God's hand was on Saul, and whatever he did, he won. Now that's kind of a tough thing. Have you ever been good at everything you've ever done? All right. Have you ever seen people that are like that? They're really good at everything they ever do. It's very hard for them to remain humble, right? It's really hard. It's hard to find uh, humble athletes. It's hard to find humble musicians. It's just hard to find people that are really good at something to be humble. And if you're really good at a particular thing, you know how that pride kind of wells up, right? I can't fix the TV. Well, I can fix the TV. Somebody said, you don't know how to fix the TV? Seriously? And you know how it kind of builds up a little bit. So 20 years goes by. And King Saul has begun to not follow God. As the prophet said for him to do something, he, didn't, he followed a little bit of it, but not most of it. So I said no, and I think what happened to King Saul was he starts to believe that he's a little bit better than everybody else. In fact, maybe a lot better than everybody else. Well, uh, normally we don't follow God and certainly don't follow his prophets. Uh, history shows us, or the scriptures show us, it doesn't end well. So what happened to Saul was, he got to a time period in his life where he couldn't sleep well at night. Thinking about all the stuff he had, uh, how he was uh, above everybody else, and he got where he couldn't sleep at night. So they said, he brought all of his key people together, he said, look, what am I supposed to do about this? He's, he was uh, tormented by this. And they said, well, there's this little guy named David, and we've heard him play the harp, and he's really good. So this guy named David was a musician. This same David that you knew slew Goliath, the same David. So you probably wouldn't have known this unless you read your Bible a little bit more. So uh, King Saul calls in David, and he says, play the harp for me. And he did, and it made him feel better, helped him every time David played the harp. So at that point, King Saul made David his armor bearer. So anytime Saul needed to put on this big armor, David was supposed to bring it. That's the picture of what we have right now. So um, he was kind of in the the praise band, I guess, for King Saul. Well, King Saul had continued to get more bitter and more angry and more jealous, and here's why. There came a time period where King Saul had gotten to the point where he didn't go out and fight battles anymore. He didn't want to go fight the battles. And you can understand, he had had success after success after success. He thought he was at a point where he didn't need to do anything. He thought he was all that, 
He couldn't sleep. He was restless. Uh, things started to go against him a little bit. And so there's this group of people called the Philistines that he had fought through this 20-year time period where he'd basically been king, 20 to 30 years. And he decides he's not going to go out and fight this guy. They have this big guy named Goliath. And so David hears about this, and he goes to the field, and he says, well, I'll fight him. I mean, I'm, he's, 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 he's saying bad things against our God. I'll take him out of the picture. And he said, I'll stand up for him. Well, you know the story. David did. In fact, King Saul came and said, here's my armor. And David said, that doesn't fit me. I don't even need it. So now you got a little backdrop of that story if you've been following it. David did. Well, then the people of Israel started singing the praises of David. They started making songs about David, saying Saul killed this many, but David killed this many more. David won this. And David now, a teenager, has become exalted. And even more than that, he now becomes good friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. He's in the middle of the court because he's been there, and now the people of Israel are exalting him. How do you think Saul responded to David? He became bitter towards David. He became bitter. Now, David had nothing but support for Saul. Nothing but support. And yet, King Saul became very bitter at David until he finally got to the point where he tried to kill David. And as multiple times you can read in, in Samuel where he tried to kill David. And uh, uh, King Saul didn't become better as he got older. He became, say it. Huh, does that, let me just ask you a question. Does that ring true for anybody you know in your family? They got older and they didn't get better, but they got bitter. Now, this isn't a message just for people my age and above, but it's not just a message for people my age and down. In other words, if you're getting older, you should already know by watching your parents that most of the times they either get bitter or, say it, bitter or what? There's no in-between. There's no in-between. King Saul got bitter. King Saul didn't get better. You know how it went for King Saul at the end? An arrow pierces through his armor. He dies. His three sons die with him in battle because of his bitterness. Because of his bitterness. Because of his bitterness. And David takes over the throne. See, bitterness is some really bad stuff. It's some really bad stuff. So I want you to just now mentally just stop for a second. Bitterness is bad stuff. It's like a poison in your system. We seem to be a group of people in our country that seem to have a bitterness problem, no matter what side we land on. And it's a poison. I don't want us to poo-poo it away. I want to give you a couple stories without naming names, because this could be repeated multiple times, of things that I've had in my ministry time period here for the 16 years of our church, the 15 years of our church. <laughs> I had a, uh, a girl come in, and this could be multiplied times at least 10. And she was very bitter in, in student ministry. Uh, her body language was tight. Her, uh, her gaze looked through you almost, you know, like piercing. And the defining character of her was she was bitter because her parents had divorced. And it wasn't the divorce, it was the abandonment of one of the parents that caused the bitterness. Now, you could see it in how they sat. They were lonelier than other kids. The posse, the people they hung with, was a smaller group because they gave an aura of, I don't, I don't want to be around you. I'm bitter. I'm bitter. And that played out itself in anger. Now, you might be that bitter girl or that bitter boy. And there may be reason for your bitterness. But does that bitterness make you better? See, I've not seen a bitter student that makes them better at life. I've just not seen it. Now, in some cases, I've seen kids be bitter for a long time period. I hope little Henry, who's three, I hope he doesn't stay bitter. I believe it's a stage of his age. But bitter is dangerous, so dangerous to our soul. 
Uh, I've done quite a few funerals. It's crazy how many times a bitter parent has exed somebody out of a will or has changed a will. And now the siblings all become bitter at one another fighting over money. It's, it's, it's terrible to watch the bitterness of what happens with that. How uh, two brothers, I'm thinking of one story that I know, two brothers were close, really close. And the mom loved them both equally. She died first. The dad was still alive. And he became more cantankerous and bitter as he got older. And I don't know what his deal was. I, I wish he would have heard a message like this. I think he had a choice, but he became more bitter. He decided that he didn't like the, the, the children, the grandchildren of one of the brothers because that brother had, had remarried. So he changes the will that everything goes to the other son and not the one son because he didn't eventually want it to go down to the grandchildren that weren't biologically his. Now, it caused a bitter root that still, as far as I understand, goes on today between the two brothers. And bitterness is terrible. Bitterness uh, is one of Satan's key weapons. That's what I want to let you know. So we think there's an evil one. And we think that he uses things that would cause us uh, to harm our lives and other people. Bitterness is one of those things. It's an arrow that when he lodges it, it's poisonous. It impacts everything. I'm going to read John 10.10 10 to you. And um, it's a verse that, one of Herc's favorite verse, we've heard it over and over again. I just want to highlight something about this in John 10.10. 10. It says, the thief, which means Satan, he comes only to steal kill and destroy. And Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, bitterness is one of the things that the thief will use in your life. Let me flip this around a little bit before I start to drive this home more. If you meet a person that isn't bitter, do they normally seem like a person you want to be around more? Yes or no? They're not bitter. Doesn't it seem like you want to be around them more? It seems like their life is better. Yes or no? Yes. Now, we all have a openness, a capability to become bitter. I think no more so than today, and I'm gonna make a case for it in my last 10 minutes. And I, I want you to watch it, and this is why I mentioned earlier, it can start at a young age, and it can lodge for your entire life, not robbing you of the abundant life that God offers you, making the only one happy, Satan. It can rob you. It can rob you as you get older. You know, we lose people, a wife, a spouse, Dreams don't go the way we want. And we can either get bitter or better, but it's almost, it's, it almost goes one or the other. Either a person is either bitter or they're either better. It just seems the way that it goes. We generally become bitter or better. That's what I just wanted to hear you to hear. Well, there's this guy named Paul. I gave you King Saul in the Old Testament. He became bitter. It ended up terribly. He wasn't a king to be uh, followed, and David ended up having the throne. Well, this guy named Paul, he was one of the ones that wrote half of the New Testament, half of the new contract or new covenant, the promise between God and all people now is shown through Jesus Christ in the Bible. Paul pins half of this. And this is a guy that by all means should be better or bitter. For those of you guys who know about the Bible, should he be bitter? Yes, for one reason. All right, for one reason. Because everything he did for God, he just suffered for it over and over again. He got imprisoned. He got shipwrecked. He got beaten over and over again. Some of his best friends walked away from him. I mean, you know, there's reasons to be bitter. Hey, God, I'm doing this all for you. And look what happened. And I'm bitter about that. Hey, I've got some friends. We've done this together. And all of a sudden, they walk out. I think this is what happens to many, many pastors. The flame out rate for pastors is almost 50% because I think they get bitter because something doesn't go their way. And it's not that they got better. There was always a choice in the matter. Like I said, Paul could have been bitter. But when you read about him, he wasn't bitter at all. He wasn't bitter at all. It's a remarkable, I cannot wait if I get the privilege to meet Paul in heaven. I want to say Dude, you know, you wrote some great stuff, and it has some super advice. And I know you live this out because of what happened to you, almost to the extreme. Almost everything that happened to you was almost over the top. I mean, beaten 39 times, two or three times with a whip. 
imprisoned falsely by your own government, I mean, your own government cheated you, friends walked out on you, it seemed like God left you hanging in sometimes. And here's what he writes to the church in Ephesus, a bunch of Christians in Ephesus, in Europe. He writes this letter to them because I think he sees something starting that would have kept them from living the radical life that Jesus has for them. He says, you're starting to live like the rest of the world. You gotta watch this. And here's what he wrote in Ephesians 4, 31 through 32, before, before they put it up there. Isn't this incredible that we have this ancient document that we can read about Paul? We have this story, kind of his story. We have this commentary on what he wrote about what's going on. Here's what he wrote in Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. He said, get rid to this church. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Now just stop and look at me here. He says, get rid of bitterness. I think it's an order. See, I think he knows that when bitterness comes, there will be rage. Henry will stay in the parking lot until his mom drags him in here naked to go to class because he's that angry. Have you ever been that bitter? I'm never gonna call them again. But they're your sister. But that's your dad. I'm not going to do it. Get rid of all bitterness. Then what? To get rid of bitterness, I think rage and anger and brawling and slander and every form of I think it goes with it. Now I want to, I highlighted in there the term get rid of. If you come to me and say, Tom, we got to get rid of trash, what do I do with it? What do I do with it? Do I leave it here? What do I do with it? Take it out. Get rid of it. It's gone. Let's get it out of here. I get rid of it. I don't want it around anymore. I just don't hold it. I don't think about it. I get rid of it. He says, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Don't hold on to it. Don't harbor it. Don't compartmentalize in your life. Don't say, well, I'm bitter about this. I mean, my ex-wife did do this. Well, I'm bitter about this. My boss did that. Don't compartmentalize it and think that it's not polluting you with anger and underneath the skin level. Don't think it's not robbing you of the abundant life that Jesus wants you to have. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Now, Paul says it can be done. That's why I'm going to let you down a little bit right now. I'm not going to give you the answer. We're not going to talk about how it's going to, I don't have time this week. But next week, we're going to talk about how to get rid of it. I want you to hold on. Hold on to this for a second. He said, get rid of it. Here's some things I wrote that I'm just gonna read in order that these are true things. Bitterness will infect you if you keep it around. If you stay close to it, if you don't get rid of it, it will infect you. Whether you're 14 or whether you're in college or whether you're 30 having kids or whether you're 40, 50, the twilight of your life. When we step into the field of bitterness, we step out of the flow of following Jesus. When we step into the field of bitterness, you, we cannot follow Jesus bitterly. We cannot. Bitterness is not a crown we can wear before Jesus. It's not something we bring to him. Bitterness is a bad shepherd. And it will guide you to places you don't want to go. It's a bad leader. Bitterness binds your mind. And Jesus wants to set it free. Bitterness always brings his friends with him. Anger, slander, and hatred. You have to choose better over bitter. Old MacDonald had a farm. E. Choose the E, not the I. Choose better, not bitter. You have to see it, call it out, and you got to get rid of it. It's that important. Before I kind of finish this, you know who else had a choice that he could have been very bitter? Could you imagine, have you ever done this as a husband where you did absolutely nothing wrong and yet your wife blamed you? Has any husbands ever experienced that? <laughs> let me rephrase the question accurately. Let me, let me rephrase it. Has any husband not ever experienced that? <laughs> Jesus lived his entire life right. He lived his entire life right. And yet, 
every one of us have betrayed him. And when he walked the earth, his closest friends did. The religious leaders of the day did. His government did. He had every right to be bitter. Every right. If there's a person that could have used the, the, the uh, argument, well, you don't know what they've done to me. I didn't deserve that. I know Jesus. And yet when he was on the cross, he was still better. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I'm not going to be bitter. He wasn't bitter. You can, you can get better too. You can get that way. Jesus was and you can too. I'm hoping that for some of you, that God's speaking to your heart and saying, oh, okay, there's maybe somebody that you know that needs to hear this message. Maybe it's you're saying to yourself, I need to hear this. I know it's, it's welling up in me. I don't want it. I, wasn't, I didn't cause it, but it was thrust on me. I get that. And uh, you can become better, better over bitter. I want you to watch a video, and then I'm going to just kind of comment on this video just a little bit real quick, and then uh, we'll wrap it up right after that. So watch this little video. I do not describe myself as a black woman because that gives too much power to my blackness. I don't want black, my race, to be the describing adjective, the defining adjective of who I am as a woman. I am not a black woman. I am a Christian woman who happens to be black. Because it's the job your adjective to describe the noun of who you are and if there's going to be an adjective describing me it is not going to be my race it is going to be that I am a woman who believes in every single thing that my word that my God has declared to be true and I will stand firmly on the promises of his word because I will be girded in truth So you may be a black woman, a black man, a white woman, a white man, but that should not define you. So that if your race or if your political group is going in a different direction than the word of God, you don't choose your blackness or your whiteness or whatever culture you are, you do not choose that. Or your political persuasion over what it is that God's word declares to be true. I hate to tell you this, but God doesn't ride the backs of donkeys or elephants. He did not come to take sides. He came to take over. He came to take over. That's Priscilla Shire. She's a preacher. She wrote the book Fervent. If you want to read a book of prayer, go in the bookstore and get the book Fervent. You'll pray differently. And uh, she said something that's why I talk about this bitterness part of it. See, I, she's, your, de- your definer of who you are is not your political affiliation. That's what you vote. The definer of who you are is who you follow, whose name you call is a Christ follower. It's a Christian. And if you've identified yourself with some other moniker, then I promise you, I promise you, whether it's Republican or Democrat, you are a bitter person. If that's the first thing that comes out of your mouth, is that, oh, this is what I am. If that's what you focus on all day long, I promise you the root of bitterness is in you already. We live in the age of not information. We live in the age of opinion. It's hard to, you can find information, but you know what you find most easily today? Opinion. And that's why we're not sure what's true or not true, because it's somebody's opinion. And most of those opinions, are they bitter? Are they angry? Or do they have slander? Do they have rage? Yes or no? You watch TV. I don't care whether it's Fox News, MSNBC. Watch it. See the bitterness that's coming out. See the rage and the slander that comes with it. You're a follower of the king. You should live a radical life, not defined by some political affiliation. And I'm not telling you not to vote. I'm not telling you not to be political. I'm just trying to tell you to follow the one who doesn't ride on the back of a donkey or an elephant. He rides on high on the clouds. We live in an age of rage. It's going to destroy our country. It's already destroying lives. 
It has been for a long time. I, for one, as a Christian leader, am going to stand up more and more against it. Not, not this uh, age of rage, but the age of sin. We've got to get rid of this bitterness. There's a way to do it. There's a, there's a reasonable way, a smart way. Do you think that Paul came into a time period where it wasn't politically divided? Are you kidding me? Rome occupied Israel. Israel was a nation of slaves. They hated Rome. It couldn't have been worse. You think Jesus didn't come to the same time period? Herod had him put on the cross. The religious leaders supported it. He wasn't defined by his bitterness. I want you to vote Democrat. I wrote this down. I want you to vote Democrat, Republican, or Independent. But I want you to live following Jesus, and that will look radical. And if it doesn't look radical in your life now, then you've got to just readjust. You've got to readjust. So here's the challenge that I close this. Next week, we're going to talk about what God had to say about getting rid of this root of bitterness. Now listen, please look at me. If you were, if you were like that girl, that boy that was born where your parents separated, you know there's something bitter that went on there. Or if you had a parent abandon you later in life, and you know that root of bitterness is there, we can remove it through him. We can. There's an answer to it. There is. If you're a person that's getting older, like me, and you, you don't like that your hip bugs you more, we can get better and not bitter. We can. We can. If you're a person that's lost a child before their time, and you've had to bury them, and I know it's so easy to be angry at God, and I understand that, and I think God does too, but he doesn't want you to become bitter from it. You can come better. You can. You can. I'm asking you to come back next week or watch online. Whatever you've got to do, if God puts that on your heart. So here's just the challenge for this week. I want you to, to think of anything that causes you to become bitter this week. And if it's caused you to become bitter, if you're starting to feel a little bit of rage or anger coming up, and it's not a good rage or anger, meaning it's not, and it's going to cause you to slander people, whether deserved or not deserved, I want you to turn it off or walk away from it just for one week. Just see what happens in your life just for one week. Just try it. Now, I know what some of you might be saying. So you want me to walk away from anything that caused me to be bitter? Yes, I do. That person is sitting next to me right now, all right? You need to come back for sure next week then. Now listen, listen. It's, it's normally the people closest to us that cause us to be bitter. It's normally the topics that we're most fired up and passionate about that can cause us to be bitter. You can love the people closest to you without becoming bitter, even if they don't treat you well. You can become better. You can be passionate about things in your life, whether political or whether entertainment or whether sports or drama, without it causing you to become bitter if people disagree. You can. We can. This bitterness problem is nothing new. It wrecked King Saul. It didn't wreck Paul. And it didn't wreck Jesus. And it doesn't have to wreck you, and it doesn't have to wreck our culture. And certainly, the church should be radically known for a group of people that are not bitter, but better. Old MacDonald had a farm. Father, we just thank you. And we praise you that we can be radical. We don't have to be in this age of opinion, in this age of rage. We don't have to be infected by it, but we do have to be so aware of it that we stand mightily on your principles. God, I, I pray that today you've stirred something in my heart as well. I have to watch my bitterness. And may, I believe maybe in my own life, maybe not others, God, you know this, that the older I get, the more I have to watch it, the more I have to watch it. Help me root it out, God. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better grandfather. I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better friend. And it won't be possible if bitter takes hold. God, I pray that for all of us in this room, that we thank you. We look to you. We love you. We thank you for your spirit that gives us hope and change in life. This is in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and sing this to the king.
I hope today's been okay for you. Been okay day? Round of applause, yeah. all right? Yeah. Listen up. I challenge you. Anything that you think would cause a bitter spirit, a bitter root to stump, stump, come up in you this week, don't go there. Try and stay away from it, all right? Try and see what happens. I'm going to let you guys know something. Today for, uh, on Sunday afternoon, I am not going to watch the Rams football. I'm not going to watch the Rams. You know why? I'm very bitter about them leaving. Right? They're, they're 5-0, and oh, and I wish they were 0-5. Oh I, 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 uh, I'm glad the Cubs lost because I was bitter about the Cubs being in there. I won't watch any of the Real Housewives this week. They make me bitter. <laughs> with me on that? Now listen up. Do you want me to be better or bitter? Do you believe that bitter can infect us and grow? Yes or no? Yes. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. Now you may laugh at this. I'm not a bitter person. I'm prone to bitterness, but I'm not a bitter person because I'm aware of it. Do you know what I watch? You say, well, I got to do something. Some of you are going to realize, I, can't, I not, don't want to do that. That caused me to be bitter. Right? It caused me to, to slander or have anger. All right? So you're going to say, well, I can't. what do I do? You know what I watch? I watch Star Trek. <laughs> no. Hold on. You know why it's a spiritual thing? It doesn't cause me to get bitter. I don't hate the Klingons. I don't care nothing about them. It's, it's mindless. It can refresh me. So here's the point. It may, be, it may be that you can't walk by a certain neighbor's lawn because they didn't mow it, and it makes you bitter. It hacks you off. Go a different way. Okay, go a different way. Ask God. God, I don't want to be bitter. I don't want to be like King Saul. I want to be like King Jesus. He's the root I want in my life. See what happens. There's a God that's for you, that wants to give you an abundant life, but you sometimes have to take a step. Amen. See you guys next week. Thanks for coming.